And we're rolling. The masked professor is back on the air. I don't want to sound like I'm bitching, but oh bloody hell, I have been starting and stopping videos all day long because I keep getting interrupted. Oh, anyway, uh, I can do without my mask since I have no one here but me. Today we're going to go through manufacturing, engineering, and mechanical engineering. But not every engineering that starts with an M, since we're skipping materials engineering. All right. In um, manufacturing engineering, uh, basically there are three different uh, three different uh, styles or, or uh, sections within it. Safety speeds and feeds, and basic metal cutting operations. Although, I could have combined those last two. All right. This is the kind of thing that we see from time to time where people are acting in a way that is liable to get somebody killed. We always want to be safe in what we do. Uh, no work is so important that it should cost someone's life. All right, so some basic safety rules. Wear eye protection at all times. In an industrial environment, we want to wear eye protection that wraps around and covers the sides of your eyes as well. No loose-fitting uh, clothing, clothing or jewelry. The best thing that can happen there is that a machine tool tears off your jewelry or clothing. The worst thing that can happen is it sucks you in and badly injures you or even kills you. And do not work alone, uh, particularly when we're talking. Look, if you're walking down the aisle taking inventory, probably that's okay on your own. Uh, if you are doing heavy work where you, uh, where you might be injured and need help, that is a very bad time to work alone. First of all, always ask someone if you have questions. That should be a guiding rule in life. It's much better to ask a stupid question uh, and find out that you had totally the wrong idea than to not ask a stupid question and get hurt or destroy some equipment. Here they're illustrating three types of traditional machining operations. In turning, they're turning this uh, uh, cylindrical billet and there is a workpiece here that is taking off pieces of it to make it the right size. In drilling, the drilling, uh, the drill is twisting into some material, we're not told what, uh, although I suspect metal because they say uh, a helical chip. Uh, at the bottom here, the drill has two very sharp surfaces that are cutting into the metal. And milling, this is a, uh, a mill piece here that is cutting on a flat surface uh, uh, and you can see chips are flying out of here, right? So 
Uh, so milling is a very popular operation, can be done, uh, as you see, with a milling bit, but it can also be done uh, using a grinding uh, type operation. Here we see a typical drill press. So perhaps I should say, in the, uh, on a typical drill press, the, the drill bit is inside this orange uh, kind of conical thing here. Uh, when it comes down, that will protect the operator from flying chips and also from somebody uh, casually sticking their finger in the drill. The drill bit is turned in the case of a drill press. In the case of a lathe, the part is rotated and we use uh, different tools to remove uh, uh, metal or whatever the uh, whatever the uh, uh, substances. On the milling machine, like the drill press, the, uh, the mill piece is rotating, but the, uh, the piece is being traversed. You'll notice here the longitudinal traverse handle and there's a cross traverse as well. So, we have two different kinds of milling. There's conventional milling where the, uh, where the mill is rotating and removing uh, in an upward direction the, uh, uh, the metal chips or, or whatever the substance is. Then there's climb milling where the uh, mill end is rotating, but it's, go, it's cutting down into the part. All right, so both the color, uh, cutter and the lead screw are moving the table in the same direction in climb milling. All right, so speeds and feeds, um, well, like biting and chewing, well, I'm not sure I would have put it that, uh, fa uh, that way. Um, speed is how fast the cutting tool or the part is spinning. The feed rate is how fast, no, how fast How fast the part is advance, uh, the part is advancing into the cutting tool. Damn. Why didn't I notice all of these? Uh... Ah, okay. Cutting tool should go here. All right. Um, all right, so we have recommended cutting speeds for different substances. Um, for, uh, so you see that for uh, aluminum, brass, bronze, it's faster than when we get down here to stainless steel or tool steel. All right, so we have cutting speeds for turning, for drilling, and for milling. And these, um, 
have to be moderated uh, by uh, uh, how big the diameter is that we're cutting, for example, how big the, uh, the bit is that is cutting. Okay, so they're saying that the equation is uh, calculating the cutting RPM. So we use the same equation for a drill press, a mill, and a lathe. Uh, so our RPMs equal 3.82 times our cutting speed divided by the diameter. Okay, so RPM is revolutions per minute. We should already know that. Um, and that's for the cutting tool in milling and drilling or the workpiece uh, when we're using a lathe. Our cutting speed is in surface feet per minute. And our diameter is in inches for the cutting tool. Um, so that's for the mill or the drill or the workpiece in the case of a lathe. Okay, so you can see we've got one easy formula, no waiting. Now, our feed rate for milling, the feed is going to equal the RPM times the chip load times the number of cutter teeth, right? And you'll notice these illustrations, the different, uh, uh, the different uh, milling tools have a different number of teeth. All right, so the chip load values are found in tables, and I wish I had brought my machinery's handbook with me. But in this case, we'll use uh, 0.003 uh, inches per tooth for high-speed cutting steel. All right. The lathe feed rates uh, required for different surface finishes are uh, figured in inches per, per revolution. So we start out with what is the tool nose radius in inches uh, 164th, 1 32nd, 3 64th, 1 16th, etc., etc. And our uh, uh, rate in micro inches uh, for each of those. All right, so our manufacturing is the process of converting uh, raw material into finished products, particularly in large quantities, um, which I would call mass production. Manufactured goods uh, we see all around us. The examples they give here are air, aircraft, bicycles, electronics, coat hangers, automobiles, refrigerators, toys, clothing, cans, bottles, cell phones, oh my God, uh, these monitor screens that I see around me, the Q view over here, uh, that is part of the process of showing you this slide presentation. We use statistical methods for quality control in these processes. 
um, they bring up the, the fact that manufacturing processes are not exactly on specifications uh, because of variation. Variation, the enemy of the industrial engineer. Okay, well, you'll notice how exciting that uh, uh, presentation was. This is obviously a super, super fast look at, um, uh, at manufacturing engineering. Um, I would love to go into it more deeply but there's not time right now. Mechanical engineering is demanding to have their due. All right, so chapter 14, mechanical engineering. Mechanical engineering is one of the most versatile disciplines in the broad field of engineering. If something moves or uses energy, a mechanical engineer was involved in its design, testing, and production. Mechanical engineers also use economic, social, environmental, and ethical principles when they create new systems and products. Of course they use ethical principles. Damn it, didn't we just spend a week going over that? But mechanical engineering is a very interesting field. It uses, um, uh, it uses more mathematical science than disciplines such as industrial engineering or civil engineering does. Um, uh, although possibly not quite so much as nuclear engineering. Um, and of course, as you know, we are starting a mechanical engineering program here in the fall. Uh, I started out as a mechanical engineer. That's what I studied for my undergraduate degree. I wanted to design cars. Unfortunately, I've never designed a single car except in rough sketch form to this day. Okay, mechanical engineering is composed of the fields of thermal design and machine design. Uh, mechanical engineers use the principles of these fields to design uh, and analyze in the design and analysis, excuse me, of mechanical systems such as cars, trucks, aircraft, ships, spacecraft, turbines, industrial equipment, robots, heating and cooling systems, and medical equipment. All right, so when we split mechanical engineering into those two sides of the discipline, in thermal design, we have things like heat transfer, fluid mechanics, and thermodynamics. All of these are important no matter which side uh, you go for. On machine design, mechanical behavior, machine elements, and manufacturing processes. All right, so in thermal design, that is the combined study of heat transfer, fluid mechanics, and thermodynamics. Heat transfer is, has applications in heat exchanger design, engine cooling, air conditioning, and cooling of electronics. Fluid mechanics includes fluid statics and fluid flow as applied to areas such as piping networks, hydraulic systems, bearings, 
turbo machineries and airfoils. Ah, uh, unfortunately, it looks like we're not going to be able to do our project in any effective way. So we won't be worried too much about fluid flow on airfoils. Uh, strangely enough, I designed the entire uh, the entire uh, uh, piping for a cooling system in a hotel many years ago, the La Posada in Laredo, Texas. Unfortunately, it's been so many years ago that I'm sure since then they've ripped that out and they've got something else in. Thermodynamics includes the study of properties of pure and mixed substances, conservation of energy, and uh, refrigeration cycles, power cycles, and combustion. Um, thermodynamics uh, comes from the word thermo for heat and dynamics for movement or work for whatever good that information does you. In machine design, machine design focuses on the ba basic, basic principles of the following three areas. The mechanical behavior, that includes static, uh, statics, the science of why things stand up or fall down. Dynamics, the science of movement in uh, in elements or bodies, strength of materials, vibrations, reliability, and fatigue. Strangely enough, I never studied reliability until I was studying to be an industrial engineer. Machine elements are the basic mechanical parts of machines. They include gears, bearings, fasteners, springs, seals, couplings, and so forth. Look, anything in a machine could be uh, subject to being a machine element and being designed to fit a particular machine or situation. Um, Manufacturing processes include areas such as computerized machine control, engineering statistics, uh, quality control, ergonomics, and life cycle analysis. Well, one of the things about engineering is it's a lot less compartmentalized than it was when I was uh, a young lad in engineering school to get my bachelor's. Mechanical engineers now study engineering statistics a lot of times, which we did not um, back in the day. Quality control and ergonomics are usually considered industrial engineering applications, but I'm going to be generous and let them have it. All right, so when we talk about the elements of thermal design, in heat transfer, there are three ways that heat can transfer. The first is conduction. In other words, you heat up one end of a rod, and the heat travels along the length of the rod to the other end. If you don't heat it up very much, someone touching the other end may not even notice. Convection is the idea that airflow, huh, airflow flowing over a heated surface picks up part of that heat and carries it away. Or conversely, 
had, uh, the air itself is very heated and it gives part of that heat to uh, a colder surface. Heat has to travel from hot to cold, or at least that's our convention. Radiation doesn't mean like nuclear radiation necessarily. It means radiation like light. The sun, for example, radiates. If you stand outside in the sun, it'll make you hotter. Uh, you radiate heat uh, if you go into a room that is colder than you are. In fluid mechanics, we have two basic ways that fluids can flow. And we must remember that a fluid is a liquid or a gas. There can be laminar flow. That's when the flow is slow and uh, and it's layering up on itself. Turbulent flow is when the flow is so fast that the air can't get, uh, the fluid can't get organized for laminar flow. And thermodynamics, the conservation of mass and energy. Damn it, that's a cop out. Um, the, in thermodynamics, um, well, I'm trying to think of a way to summarize it better, but uh, again, heat and work. Oh, geez. All right, so our basic equation for steady conduction of heat, uh, heat transfer, is called Fourier's Law of Conduction. Um, the equation for conduction heat trans uh, transferring through a flat plate or a plane wall is Q um, equals KT times A times the uh, difference between the hot temperature and the cold temperature divided by the change in X, in other words, the thickness. Um, so, the KT is the coefficient of conduction of the particular substance, right? So if it's wood, that coefficient of conduction is really low. If it is steel, it's higher. If it's silver, it's even higher. A is the area uh, through which the heat is being conducted. And then, of course, the hot temperature is on one side and the cold temperature is on the other, right? Knowing what those are is crucial to being able to figure the, um, uh, figure the uh, 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 con uh, conduction rate. And the change uh, in X, again, that's the thickness, in this case, of a plate through which we are conducting heat. All right, so uh, in this equation, Q dot uh, of conduction is the conduction heat transfer rate. KT is the thermal conductivity of the material. A is the cross-sectional area perpendicular to the heat transfer direction. And change in X is the thickness of the plate or wall. All right, so on the 
hot side, you have the temperature, the hot temperature. That goes and it starts transferring through this distance, which is our change in X. And the heat is going to be very hot, close, uh, right close to, oh damn it, uh, close to the uh, surface of the plate on the hot side. It is going to go down over time until it gets to the uh, temperature on the cold side, right? So that is that change in temperature from hot to cold. All right, so our convection Convective heat transfer occurs whenever an object is either hotter or colder than a surrounding fluid. Convection occurs only in a moving liquid or gas, never in a solid. The basic equation for the rate of convection heat transfer is known as Newton's law of cooling. So our heat transfer rate of convection equals uh, H, which is uh, the coefficient of uh, convective cooling. A, again, is the area. And uh, the temperature of the uh, fluid minus the temperature of the surface. All right, so um, our uh, heat transfer rate of convection, um, oh, in this equation, Q convection is the convective heat transfer rate. H is the convective heat transfer coefficient. A is the surface area of the object being cooled or heated. T, uh, infinity, is the bulk temperature of the surrounding fluid. And T, S, is the surface temperature of the object. All right, so our algebraic sign for Newton's law of cooling is positive for the temperature of the fluid being greater than the temperature of the surface. So in that case, we have heat transfer into the object. And negative when uh, uh, T infinity is less than T surface, that's heat transfer out of the object. Um, the convective heat transfer coefficient H is a positive, experimentally determined value. Okay, so there's a heat transfer coefficient for air, for uh, water, uh, uh, for all kinds of things. In fact, with air, it's probably uh, tempered by water. How much humidity is in the air makes a big difference. Uh, there is uh, for example, here in New Mexico, at night, there is a lot of radiant heat transfer from the surface, the buildings, everything, uh, the, because they've been heated up during the day by the sun, and then at night, that radiates out into space. All right, so we have two types of convection. There's natural convection and forced convection. Nat natural convection is produced by density differences in a fluid due to temperature differences. So as the old saying goes, hot air rises. So in natural convection, we have a very hot object here. It's surrounded by a fluid and 
heat is going up away from that object uh, convecting off the surface by the fluid. We can have force convection by having a fan in the example here that is blowing air, we assume it's air, across a uh, hot surface. All right, all electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic radiation can be considered radiation heat transfer. Infrared, ultraviolet, visible light, radio and television waves, and so on, are all forms of radiation heat transfer. However, a lot of them, the heat transfer aspect is so low you don't notice it. How much heat transfer do you feel to your body from the radiation of uh, the KCZY radio station here? I'm guessing you can't even notice it. If an object with a surface temperature TS is emitting or receiving thermal radiating energy to or from its surroundings at temperature T infinity, then the rate of thermal radiation is expressed by the Stephen Boltzmann law of radiation. Heat transfer from radiation equals epsilon times A times sigma uh, times the quantity, uh, the temperature of the surroundings raised to the fourth power minus the temperature of the surface raised to the fourth power. All right, that's where our Q uh, uh, radiation is the radiation heat transfer rate. Epsilon is the dimensionless emissivity or absorptivity. The hot object emits energy and the colder object absorbs energy of the object. A is the surface area of the object and sigma is the Stefan Boltzmann constant 5.69 times 10 to the negative 8 watts per meter squared uh, de degrees Kelvin to the fourth, or uh, 0.1714 times 10 to the negative eighth BTU uh, per hour square foot uh, degrees Rankin to the fourth. Now, we've never really talked about degrees Kelvin or degrees Rankin. Degrees Kelvin is the same scale as the uh, 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 sonograde temperature scale, except that you add another 273 degrees. Why do we do that? because absolute zero is negative 273 point something degrees uh, uh, below zero. By the same token, degrees Rankin uses the same idea with the Fahrenheit temperature scale. There we add uh, 456 uh, degrees uh, because from zero in the Fahrenheit scale to absolute zero is another 456 point something degrees. All right, so the equation has temperature raised to the fourth power. That means we have to use the absolute temperature units in Rankine or Kelvin 
because otherwise we would be in a relative scale and our calculations would make no sense. All right, a black object is defined as any object whose emissivity, e emis, who uh, emits at an epsilon equals one level. And a perfectly reflecting object has an emissivity of zero. All right, so do we have any perfect black objects? They, there are constructs called black bodies that absorb uh, all energy and it's very difficult for energy to escape. So, uh, uh, so those black bodies barely, uh, they're very close to that epsilon equals one. On the other hand, if you have a board that is p painted a flat white, that is just about as close as you can get to an emissivity, emiss to zero emission. Um, you might think you could take a mirror out and it would have that uh, uh, epsilon equals zero quality, but no, because the light has to penetrate the surface and then travel through the, the material to the back and be reflected back out, that causes it to be a higher emissivity. Hey, I got it right that time. Yay for me. All right, so the uh, illustration here is a uh, solar uh, heating system. So we get thermal radiation from the sun, and that comes into our solar collector, which is as close to a black body as we can make it. We are then pumping that hot water in the red lines, oops, pumping that hot water into the tank, uh, and it is losing heat, uh, losing heat uh, uh, to the surrounding fluid, and then as the water gets colder and colder, it is pumped back into the solar collector to be heated up. In this case, we also have a boiler, which is creating hot water, pumping that through uh, our, what I assume is our hot water tank. Although in this case, they have the hot water faucet and the shower uh, running off that. All right, so fluid mechanics, again, a fluid can be either a liquid or a gas. Um, and like solid mechanics that separates the study of statics from dynamics, fluid mechanics deals with fluid statics and fluid dynamics. Fluids are characterized by properties such as density. That is mass per unit volume measured either in kilograms per cubic meters or pounds mass per cubic feet. Pressure is force per, per unit area measured in pascals. Um, one pascal equals one newton per, uh, per square meter or it can be measured in PSI. Uh, PSI is foot-pound force 
um, divided by inches squared. So, uh, normal air pressure at sea level, 101.325 pascals, or 14.696 uh, pounds force per cubic, uh, per square inch. Viscosity is the fluid's resistance to flow. Viscosity is typically measured in units of newton seconds per meter squared or foot pounds uh, or pounds for seconds per feet squared. Very often, well, when I was in mechanical engineering school, one of the problems that vexed us was where is the dividing line between solids and liquids, right? And a lot of people said, oh, it's peanut butter, right? Because peanut butter is kind of a solid and kind of a liquid. Um, any of you who have ever put too much peanut butter on toast knows that it's very close to being a, a liquid at any given time. Man, we argued about really riveting stuff when uh, uh, we were in engineering school, didn't we? Okay, laminar flow occurs at low speeds when a fluid flows in parallel layers that slide past each other like playing cards. In a pipe, the laminar flow pattern is a parabola peaking at the center of the pipe and zero at the pipe walls. In laminar flow, the motion of the fluid is very orderly. Turbulent flow is characterized by chaotic fluid motion. The fluid undergoes irregular fluctuations or mixing and the speed of the fluid at a point is continuously changing. All right, so they uh, show us here illustrations of laminar flow. Up here at the wall, we consider the flow uh, speed to be zero. The highest flow rate is going to be here in the center. Uh, that's in a condition of laminar flow. In turbulent flow, it's Katie bar the door. It's all confused and running back and forth. Dogs and cats marrying one another and living in sin. Well, anyway, uh, turbulent flow makes it a lot harder to uh, calculate. And a lot of things are going to depend on Reynolds' number. Oh, well, and here comes Reynolds' number. All right, so the factor that determines which type of flow is present is the Reynolds' number, RE, RE equals rho, the Greek letter rho, for the density of the fluid, V, the velocity, D, the diameter, and, um, excuse me, that's a characteristic dis distance. What a mistake on my part. Uh, and, uh, and mu is the viscosity. All right, so rho and mu are the fluid's density and viscosity, respectively. V and D are fluid speed and a characteristic distance. The Reynolds number is dimensionless as shown by its units. Okay, so they show you um, this is rho, the density, 
velocity, meters per second. Characteristic distance is in meters. Um, our viscosity, uh, you'll notice they flipped it upside down from what they showed us before, where it was Newton seconds per square meter. Now it's meters squared divided by the quantity Newton seconds. Why did they do that? Because mu was being divided into this other stuff, so to make it come out right, they, uh, they flipped it upside down. All right, so uh, when we go through that, it turns out to be dimensionless. Fluid statics. For an incompressible fluid at rest, the fluid statics equation is just the weight of a fluid column and the pressure it exerts. So, pressure, one, uh, pressure 2 minus pressure 1 is equal to the density rho times uh, the uh, gravity times the difference in heights, z2 minus z1, divided by the gravitational constant. So Z2 minus Z1 is height difference, G is acceleration of gravity, and uh, GC equals 32.2 pound, uh, pound mass feet per uh, uh, pound force second squared, or one in SI units. Now, why, uh, let's go back a second. When they say an incompressible fluid at rest, what is the difference between an incompressible fluid and a compressible fluid? And don't say compressibility because we've all heard that old joke. Ordinarily, Liquids are, uh, are uh, considered to be uh, incompressible. There are some exceptions, uh, some ways to make liquids a bit compressible, but ordinarily the dividing line is liquid or gas. All right, so an incompressible fluid in steady motion can be modeled between two points, one and two, in a flow by the Bernoulli equation, uh, pressure one minus pressure two divided by the density, rho, plus the velocity of one squared minus velocity of two squared divided by twice the gravitational constant plus uh, the uh, uh, acceleration due to gravity divided by gravitational constant times the quantity Z1 minus Z2, the difference in height, equals zero. Of course, that's where uh, P is fluid pressure V is fluid speed, Z is fluid height, and Rho is the fluid dis density. Uh, we must remember this is approximately true because we neglect frictional loss due to the fluid viscosity. Uh, okay. I'll take that. Whew. All right, so thermodynamics. Third, thermodynamics is the study of energy and its transformation from one form to another. The efficient use of natural and renewable energy sources 
is one of the most important technical, political, and environmental issues of the 21st century. Um, all right, I have my doubts, but I'm going to let them go with that. Uh, for those reasons, thermodynamics can be used in ways that improve the lives of people around the world. <clears throat> the thermodynamic system is the item we analyze, and everything else in the universe is called the system's surroundings. There are three types of systems. Isolated, closed, and open. Okay, so you remember when we studied about control volumes. When they have these dotted lines here, these are control volumes that define system boundaries. Isolated systems cannot exchange mass or energy with its surroundings. <coughs> Uh, more tea. Closed systems can exchange energy, but not mass with the surroundings. And open systems can exchange both mass and energy with the surroundings. So you'll notice our first illustration here is an isolated system. Our uh, water in a pot is closed off from anything in the area. It can't exchange mass or energy. Our closed uh, systems system here can exchange energy. The fire is under the pot uh, to boil the water or heat it up at the very least. Right, so it can exchange energy, but the mass is going to be kept in by the lid. And an open system, you'll notice water is dripping in, uh, and energy can cross the boundary, although it doesn't have a little flame like this other one. The first law of thermodynamics is that energy is conserved. That is, energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can be converted from one form of energy into another form of energy. Uh, uh, okay, so... Uh, you eat lunch, then you go for a bicycle ride. You are converting that chemical energy uh, that you took in at lunch into uh, dynamic energy in, uh, through your muscles. And then that is coming out of your body as heat. There are many different forms of energy, kinetic, potential, thermal, work, magnetic, chemical, and so forth. Oh, bloody hell. Modern society benefit, benefits from a variety of energy conversion technologies. Uh, the example, an automobile's engine to convert chemical energy of gasoline into kinetic energy of the vehicle. So, for uh, the first law of thermodynamics, for any process that converts a closed system from state one to state two, the change in the system's internal energy, U2 minus U1, can be found from an energy balance on the heat transfer rate minus work equals the internal energy at state two minus the internal energy at state one plus the uh, mass uh, times the quantity, uh, the velocity at two squared minus velocity at one squared 
divided by 2 times the gravitational constant plus mass times gravity divided by gravitational constant times the quantity Z2 minus Z1. All right, so Q is the amount of heat added to the system, and W is the work done by the system. The two remaining terms are the changes in kinetic and potential energy of the system. Note that U, Q, W, K, E, and P, E must all have the same uh, units, either BTUs, foot pound uh, force, or joules. All right, so you're probably saying, wait a minute, where does kinetic energy and potential energy come into it? All right, so here is the kinetic energy portion of the equation, and here is the potential energy portion of the equation. All right, so the elements of machine design. Boy, there is a lot of words in this uh, presentation. The design process uh, involves developing a plan to meet a need or solve a problem. Hmm, sounds like engineering design to me. For example, if you were designing something as simple as a chair, some things you need to consider are, is it going to be an easy chair, an office chair, or a chair for a dining room table? Second consideration, who will be using it, an adult or a child? Third consideration, the material used in the construction of the chair, wood, metal, plastic, or a combination of materials. Fourth consideration, the strength and cost of the material used to make the chair. And fifth consideration, the shape and artistic appeal of the chair. All right, so we talked earlier in this presentation about strength of materials. And in this slide, the behavior of materials. When engineers select the materials that are to be used in the machines they design, they need to know how these materials will behave under reasonable operating conditions. So a design engineer must, first of all, design, uh, define the material requirements, right? So if you are going to be building a chair, like in the last slide, you're not going to specify dirt as your material. The second point, understand the classes of materials such as metals and polymers, right? Uh, very often we see chairs that are made with metals, but we also see chairs that have large elements that are plastics or polymers. Third point, understand the internal microstructure of materials, which can be crystal, crystalline or amorphous. Excuse me, excuse me, amorphous. The fourth point, use stress strain diagrams to express materials properties in terms of five engineering variables. Stress, strain, elastic limit, yield strength, and toughness. Use the results determined for those variables to carry out material selection. Okay, so behavior of material is obviously very important. Uh, of course, when the first engineering happened in ancient times, 
they didn't understand all these things. Uh, they tried things and said, well, that seems to work. Let's do that again. Uh, even to the point where during, um, uh, during the medieval period, uh, they built many, many cathedrals that almost immediately fell down because they didn't understand how force transferred through their materials. So machine elements are basic mechanical parts used as the building blocks of machines. They include shafts, gears, bearings, fasteners, springs, seals, couplings, and so forth. I hate it when they say and so forth. All right, so gears are used when engineers must deal with rotary motion and rotational speed. Rotational speed is measured in two ways. In the number of revolutions per minute, or RPM, and, oh bloody hell, I've forgotten which Greek letter this is, and let's call it funny W, radians per second. Since there are two pi radians in a complete circle, N is equal to 60 times funny looking W divided by 2 pi. So that's seconds per minute, radians per second, revolutions per radian equals RPM. And conversely, funny looking W is equal to 2 pi N divided by 60 in radians per second when N is in RPM. Okay, easy enough. When we have gears intermeshing and you really don't find gears doing much else, we have to worry about the gear ratio or GR. The gear ratio of a gear train is the ratio of the angular speed of the input gear to the angular speed of the output gear. The GR, gear ratio of a simple gear train is gear ratio GR equals input rotation divided by output rotation, which uh, equals N1 divided by N2 equals D2 divided by D1 equals T2 divided by T1, uh, right, in which D stands for diameter and T stands for number of teeth per gear. Uh, okay, then we can have a compound gear train where we have sets of multiple interacting gears on separate shafts that can be very easily treated using our gear ratio concept. So our gear ratio is going to be the product of diameter or number of teeth of driving gears divided by the product of diameter or number of teeth of driven gears. All right, so in your car, for example, the transmission uses something that looks very much like this to take the RPMs from the engine and turn them into a number of useful RPMs uh, for the wheels or for the rear end of your car, depending on whether you have a front wheel drive or a rear wheel drive car. Gears not only change the rotational speed, they also change the torque of the axle. The, uh, this equation shows that the torque, T, varies inversely with speed. 
So T2 divided by T1 equals N1 divided by N2 equals T2 divided by T1 equals D2 divided by D1 equals uh, R2 divided by R1. Uh, R2 and R1 are the radius of the gears. Um, although, uh, I guess, oops, really, you already had that information here with D2 divided by D1. So, oh well, whatever. Therefore, to apply high torque to a shaft, we would use large gears turned slowly by small intermeshing gears. We can use gears to achieve a desired combination of torque and RPM. Uh, for example, the manual transmission of an automobile. Well, okay, carry on. So, everything that we use at home, at work, and at play was manufactured. Um, manufactured goods are everywhere. They're aircrafts, bicycles, electronics. Oh, bloody hell, didn't they give us this list already? Manufacturing in the 21st century is far more than assembly and production. It also involves a broad spectrum of other functions such as research and development, engineering, sales and management, warehousing and storage, and shipping. All of these things existed before the 21st century. It's only now that we have successfully broken them down into subspecialties that make it easier for people to be subspecialists. Life cycle manufacturing is something that we worry about in engineering these days. Life cycle manufacturing activities are critically important in adding value to products by First of all, providing a green manufacturing environment. As I've said before, we want to figure out what happens to everything that we use and leave the earth uh, as good as we found it, if not better. Second point, creating competitive advantage through innovation short delivery times, customer service, and so forth. Um, I would say and so forth is high quality. Uh, if you are really interested in that aspect, I teach lean production class in the spring where we go through all of this stuff. Uh, point three, adding value through software components and communication connectivity. Enabling mass customization of products for unique market segments through increased understanding of consumer groups and on-demand production responses. When we talk about life cycle manufacturing, every product goes through a life cycle. First, there is the conception phase, we're thinking of an idea. Then there is the planning phase. How do we bring that idea into the real world in a way that is helpful for humanity? Then there is the production phase where we are making the product and selling the product to people. And then there is the retirement phase, where the product is now 
worn out, uh, and we must take it and recycle it or dispose of it in a way that doesn't harm the earth. All right, so in summary, mechanical engineering is composed of two broad fields of thermal design and machine design. Thermal design is composed of the subjects of heat transfer, fluid mechanics, and thermodynamics. Machine design is composed of the subjects mechanical behavior, machine elements, and manufacturing processes. Each of these subjects is so important that a mechanical engineering student will have at least one course in each of these six subjects. All right. So there, take that. Okay, I hope you've enjoyed today's presentation on manufacturing engineering and mechanical engineering. Uh, I will post homework that has some simple problems from chapters 12 and 14 uh, uh, to Moodle for you to solve. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, please stay, stay safe. And when the fields are white with daisies, we'll meet again.